You want to know how he chooses and chooses and chooses. Are you ready for some science? Here is number three of six impossible things. In part one and two, I looked at how we see things, first in mirrors, and then how we perceive colours. The connection between the two is, of course, light. Without light, we will not see anything. When we think of light, we think of the sun. And the sun is my third impossible thing. The sun might easily be the most important thing in our lives. We would not be here without it. It gives us heat, light, and, through photosynthesis, food. But it shouldn't be able to do any of this. It should not shine. It should not give off heat. It should simply be a ball of spinning gas. And we should not be here. Why? I hear you ask. Well, did you ever play with magnets as a kid? I found them fascinating, especially the way they repel each other. There is something magical about them, and it appeals to kids and uneducated adults as well, apparently, if the number of perpetual motion device videos on YouTube are anything to go by. This video isn't about magnets. I simply wanted you to have in your mind the incredible repulsive force of magnets as I continue. Since the dawn of man, or the dawn of human sentience, the sun has been a wonder and a mystery. Very early on, our forebears learned of its importance to us. They worshipped it as a supernatural entity. It's sobering to think that for around 200,000 years, us clever apes treated the sun as if it was something supernatural, until Galileo finally dispelled that myth. To put it another way, if we collapsed the history of Homo sapiens into one elapsed year, with the distinctive attributes of our species appearing in Africa around the 1st of January, and us looking back from midnight here on the, the following 31st of December, then our ancestors were worshipping the sun as something supernatural for the entire 12 months of our existence, until Galileo came along and proved it was not some perfect celestial sphere just 18 hours ago. But I could go even further and say that in reality we were still in the dark until just 4 hours ago, when other brilliant minds finally figured out how the sun works. So what is that ball of gas, and how does it shine? The Sun is made up of roughly 75% hydrogen, 24% helium, with the remaining being approximately 1% oxygen and 0.69% other metals. To give some perspective, that 1.69% is about 5,000 times the mass of the Earth. So to the science, hopefully simple science. Within the Sun, four hydrogen atoms combine to form a helium atom, and in the process release energy. It is this released energy which illuminates and warms us. A hydrogen atom consists of a proton and an electron. A helium atom consists of two protons, two neutrons and two electrons. So for the nuclear fusion within the Sun to occur, the hydrogen protons have to come together and one of them decay into a neutron. That's all the detail we need for now. The key is the combining of the protons. Protons are electrically positive, and they repel one another. Think back to our magnets. The force holding protons apart is an electrostatic force and is known as the Coulomb barrier. Within large atomic nuclei, where protons are close together, they are held in place by the strong nuclear force. But the strong nuclear force only operates over a distance of around 1 to 3 femtometers. A femtometer is one billionth of a nanometer, and a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. The point is that the repulsive electrostatic force, the Coulomb barrier, is so strong that it will prevent the protons ever getting close enough for the strong nuclear force to take over and bind them together. So how do protons that are doomed never to meet get across this Coulomb barrier? Enter the impossible world of quantum physics. And here is the board to bits physics primer for the interwebs generation. It all started around 1650. The vacuum pump was invented by Otto von Guericke 
and science started to seriously suck. Then in the early 19th century, the geeks started to figure out the basics of power generation and realised that they could have electric gadgets in their bedrooms. Many young men then shunned further human contact, preferring to suck on glass tubes and then pass electricity through the rarefied air inside, just to see what would happen. In 1838, Michael Faraday first noticed a light arc emanating from the cathode of an evacuated tube, partially evacuated tube, and extending towards the anode. And thus it began. For the first time in recorded human history, pasty-faced, nerdy men started spending hours alone in their rooms, staring at dimly lit glass screens. By the 1870s, the Crookes tube was produced with a better vacuum, and a dark spot was noticed just in front of the cathode. As the vacuum in the tube was increased, the dark spot spread down the tube until the tube was totally dark, except for the anode end, where the glass would glow. The geeks now had moving pictures to watch in their bedrooms, and that was the last time they would ever use the word vacuum. What the nerds had stumbled upon in their unending quest of a technical replacement for human interaction was the cathode ray tube. In 1897, J.J. Thompson determined that these cathode rays were actually corpuscles of negative energy emanating from within atoms. At the time, it was considered that the hydrogen atom was as small as things got, but Thompson's corpuscles were a thousand times smaller than a hydrogen atom. These corpuscles would become known as electrons, which George Johnson Stoney had earlier suggested as the word for the fundamental unit of electricity. Thomson made a bit of a pudding of himself trying to explain how an electrically neutral atom could produce these negatively charged electrons. The Geiger-Marsden experiment proved, contrary to Thomson's plum pudding theory, that atoms actually consisted of negative electrons plus a relatively tiny central core which is positively charged. This became known as the Rutherford model of the atom, released to the world in 1911. The 1913 Bohr model of the atom looks like the Rutherford model, but it is underpinned by fundamentally different physics. In the Rutherford model, the orbiting electrons would lose energy as they orbited and quickly spiral into the nucleus. This would make all atoms inherently unstable. Furthermore, as they spiralled towards the nucleus, the energy the electrons emitted would gradually increase in frequency as the orbit got smaller and faster. And this could not be so. To understand why, we have to step back in time to 1878. This is when a German Planck was told by his teacher not to bother unless he wanted to fill some holes. Planck was working on how to get the maximum light out of a light bulb for the minimum energy input. Despairing of finding a solution, Planck finally resorted to the controversial statistical mathematics of Ludwig Boltzmann, and he then proposed a theory which defined light in terms of quanta. Einstein built on Planck's work in 1905 when he released his paper on the photoelectric effect, showing that all light was quantized. And by 1911, the scientific community knew that there was a problem in the world of classical physics. The first Solvay conference of 1911 was convened specifically to talk all about radiation and the quanta. And so we find ourselves back in 1913 and the new Bohr model of the atom, which states that the electrons can only orbit the nucleus at some quantized energy levels and thus at set distances. Electrons can quantum jump between the various energy levels, or shells, by either absorbing or releasing a specific quanta of energy. This is a good conceptual model of the atom, especially when considering the absorption and emission of energy by electrons. But it is completely wrong, because electrons, like all subatomic particles, are not actually particles at all. In 1926, Erwin Schrödinger, presented his paper, Quantization as an Eigenvalue Problem, in which he introduced the wave equation, undeniably one of the most important papers of the 20th century. In classical or Newtonian mechanics, a particle always has a definable and precise location and momentum, and these change according to Newton's laws. 
In quantum physics, particles do not have a definable precise location or momentum until they are measured, at which point their location and momentum is discovered to be randomly selected from a probability distribution. The Schrodinger wave equation predicts that probability distribution. So using the Schrodinger equation, we might show the electron in a hydrogen atom, for example, as a cloud of probability and show that there are areas where the electron is most likely to be. But we have to remember that there is absolutely no place, according to the Schrodinger wave equation, in the entire universe where there is zero probability of finding that electron which means that the electron you expect to be orbiting the hydrogen nucleus might in fact be at the other end of the universe. Impossible? Well, maybe there's two impossible things in this video then. Because what is true for the electron is true for all subatomic particles. So if we return to the protons, as our hydrogen protons come together in the sun, they arrive at the Coulomb barrier. But because of quantum mechanics, there is a small probability that they have crossed the barrier. And whilst that probability is small, there are enough hydrogen atoms interacting for nuclear fusion to take place. This ability for the protons to overcome the Coulomb barrier, which would be impossible in a world of pure classical physics, is known as quantum tunneling. And that is why the sun shines though not very often in England. If you like the video, thumb it up. If you don't, thumb it down. Subscribe if you haven't, and thank you for watching.